This is a very poignant place for our next um, conversation for the next hour or so. We're in a tunnel uh, in London, and as many of you will know from your history lessons, the tunnels of London were where most of London actually came during the Second World War when the bombs were raining down on this city. So we're here to discuss uh, national security and the opportunities and threats provided by artificial intelligence. And the session is broken up into two sections. First off, we have a fireside chat for 20 minutes, and then we have a panel discussion. And your host of the panel and leading the fireside chat is Jonathan Luff, who is co-founder of Cylon London and a former prime ministerial advisor. And he is joined by our very special guest, Captain Robert Smith. Thank you much, thank you. Thank you. Um, but firstly, Sarah, thank you for the welcome. Uh, thank you also for not mentioning which Prime Minister uh, I was advising. It's not terribly popular in certain parts these days. Um, so as uh, Sarah said, my name is Jonathan Luff. Um, uh, I'm a recovering diplomat. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I spent 15 years in government service before setting up Cylon, which is a cybersecurity accelerator. Um, and I have some experience working in uh, national security and defense policy during that time in government and uh, have worked subsequently on national security issues in the technology space. I am absolutely thrilled to have uh, with me on stage uh, Captain Robert Smith. Welcome. I hope, uh, I hope we're going to have an interesting conversation. Um, chatting before the session, um, may I call you Bobby? Is that yeah, all right? That's yes. Fine. Uh, Bobby and I were, um, uh, were discussing uh, 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 the chat. Uh, and um, I, I discovered this is, this is his very first um, uh, opportunity to speak since uh, retiring from uh, military service as one of the most decorated officers uh, in the US military. So I think we're, we're extremely fortunate. I hope you'll uh, join me in welcoming, welcoming him to London. So as Sarah said, we've got about 20 minutes to, uh, to talk before we're joined by a very eminent panel. Um, I thought, Bobby, I'd start just by asking you to, to tell us a little about your career, because it's a truly fascinating one. Um, how did you start out, and where did, you, uh, where did, it, where did it take you? Okay. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to attend. Um, I'm honored to, to come and speak uh, at, at the venues here. And... Um, I'd like to say I'm, a, I'm not a recovering diplomat, but I am a recovering U.S. Navy SEAL. Um, after 30 years of service, uh, I retired uh, about a week ago. I retired from the Navy SEALs, uh, 30 years, all in the SEAL teams. Uh, I attended the United States Naval Academy in 1985, graduated in 89, and coming out of the Naval Academy, you have the opportunity you choose whether you want to be a Navy pilot, a ship driver, submarines, uh, or there's a small group that gets to select the Navy SEALs. Uh, it doesn't mean you're a Navy SEAL. It means that you go out to the training center, yeah. uh, one of the more challenging training centers that we have in, in military. Uh, I, think, I think you've got British sort of understatement already mastered there. <laughs> Uh, about uh, two out of every guys uh, will graduate from the training, uh, basic underwater demolition SEAL training, BUDS uh, that we refer to as SHORT. Uh, two out of uh, about an 80% attrition rate. And so I completed that uh, and was assigned to several SEAL teams. Assigned to the, Initially, we have our SEAL teams based out of the east and west coast of the United States, yep. California and Virginia. I started off in California. I uh, did a deployment to the Pacific Theater, and then uh, after some language training at uh, Monterey, which is a great place. Great place to do Car language Carmel, training. Carmel, California, uh, <laughs> the Defense Language Institute. Uh, yeah, so I had the opportunity to enjoy uh, Northern California as well as uh, learn some languages. Can I ask which languages you, you, you yeah. study? So I studied French, but uh, a please. very important <laughs> language for special operations. I can, I can, I can assure you. <laughs> and it was it was a great time. And I, I I just returned from France, so I had the opportunity to use yeah. un peu, <laughs> un peu de français. 
but then I was assigned to the East Coast uh, SEAL teams, East Coast based SEAL teams, and uh, de did deployments to the uh, across the the globe, uh, here in Europe, uh, Africa, South America, the Middle East, um, for the next um, pretty much the next 20, 28 years of my career. Uh, all the different SEAL teams out there. Could I just ask you, you know, I, I, the, the audience, I'm sure, you know, has a, has a fair degree of understanding of, 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 of these issues, but, you know, I think for, for those who don't know, um, just a few details on, on the SEAL teams, because a lot of people who have heard of SEAL teams right. won't necessarily know how you distinguish between the various teams and what their responsibilities are. Is it possible just yeah. to say a few words about that? Sure. The, uh, the SEAL teams is a, uh, is a component of the United States Special Operations Command, which uh, for the Department, the U.S. Department of Defense, the, the U.S. Special Operations Command conducts all the special operations across the globe. Uh, they have the uh, U.S. Army Special, uh, uh, special Forces, which includes the Rangers and uh, the Special Forces guys uh, at Fort Bragg. Yeah. Uh, the SEALs uh, is the maritime component of the Special Operations Command, which has SEAL teams on the east and west coast that uh, are regionally based, and the west coast more uh, predominantly signed to the Pacific Theater, West East, East Coast, uh, the European Theater. Uh, we do similar missions uh, between us and the Special Forces, the Army Special Forces. However, we look at more maritime environment all the way inland where they look at air, uh, most of the land. So is it, is it fair to say that the sort of the UK equivalents would be the SBS and the SAS? Very, very similar. Yeah, and, the, and as here, those two, those two organizations are pretty interchangeable. They conduct similar operations, although right. uh, the maritime component has a specialization. That's, that's and if uh, there's always that healthy, uh, healthy competition. Co competition between yeah. the land and the maritime component. And, you know, of course, we always say that the SEAL teams are better than the special yeah, forces. Of course, yeah. <laughs> so we, we're going to come on to um, technology and, and its yeah. use uh, uh, in, the, in the U.S. military and uh, in, the, in conflict zones uh, in a moment. Um, just, could you just bring us right up to date? Because, you know, you've obviously served in, uh, in special forces around the world, but I know you've also been um, working at the Pentagon. Uh, do you want to just say a few words about your, your, your role uh, advising uh, senior political figures uh, in, in recent years? Sure. The, uh, the evolution of technology with, within the military, and I've seen this over the th past 30 years, where when I arrived at the Naval Academy, we were still studying celestial navigation. Right. Uh, you know, the GPS really was not a tool. We, um, soldiers and the SEALs were using handheld uh, compasses yeah. to navigate across land. So we see that evolution of the technology and how it uh, makes the, the soldiers and the sailors and, ser and Marines that much more effective in executing their mission. So, so I've, I've seen that all the way to the development of, now we have dr uh, drones, uh, we've got unmanned aerial, unmanned ground, robotics. Uh, that, that I've seen over the course of my career. Uh, at the final, um, few years of my career, I served uh, as the senior military advisor to the Secretary of the Navy, as well as the, an advisor to the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence, uh, predominantly working uh, with the Algorithmic Warfare Crest Functional Team, more commonly known as Project Maven. Great. Well, I think we'll, we'll, we'll come on to that in, yeah. in a minute, if that's okay. But the, the, thought, the question I'd sort of start out with is, as, as we sort of get into a conversation about about technology was just to ask you to reflect back on on your career in service yeah. uh, and perhaps even before that to the to the things that, that that you think have been the most significant technological changes in terms of how they've affected the way not just special forces but the military does its job uh, be really interested in your thoughts on on those on those changes well I, I think the uh, the integration of, uh, of space and satellite systems uh, providing a, a battlefield visualization to the soldiers real time on the ground has probably what been one of the more significant uh, advantages that we've seen in the development of technology. Uh, when, I f when I first came in, you've got, you, you, you did your planning for an operation uh, in an isolated and you're given paper. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, analog is the you're, you're still working on analog with yeah. maps yeah. and and you developed your plan and then you left 
uh, you were lucky to have an HF radio mm -hmm. to communicate back and forth with the headquarters after you left. Uh, now we have satellite communications, uh, GPS systems, uh, downloading information real time to the service member as they're approaching a target, as they're uh, moving forward. Uh, that, that ability to give a real-time visualization to the soldier uh, creates uh, accuracy, speed, um, uh, it reduces error. Um, you know, the, the error, uh, did, did, are, you, are you at the right um, target? Uh, and so, you know, to me, what we're doing is we're really um, making a, you know, in the past when warfare uh, was, was not necessarily clean because of lack of the, the lack of technology, it, it, it provides a, a little bit, the accuracy allows us to be more definitive in our selection. So, so we, can, we can talk about error and, yeah. and the, both the, you know, the, uh, the errors that are, are made and the errors that perhaps can be avoided. I thought, you know, before we get, get into that, I'd just ask you to say a few words maybe on, on the US mm -hmm. and the US advantage in, you know, in terms of military and technological superiority. It's, it's long been um, of, of its real importance to U.S. national security to retain a significant advantage in terms of its military power and technological um, uh, advancement. Now, I, I saw this myself uh, in Iraq in, in 2003. Um, the, the, the real scale, not just, not just the technological ad, a, a advantage, but the advantage of scale was, was, was obvious. Just uh, for a layperson like myself, seeing you know a line of tankers even as far as the eye could see at Baghdad Airport while the, while the fighting's still taking place, the ability yeah. to move that amount of material and, and manpower um, is is something that really you know, very few militaries can achieve. Now that's 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 one kind of yeah. advantage. But do, is is that has that changed over the course of your career? Is the is the U.S. military still ahead of everybody else in terms of its capability and its technology? Uh, yeah, I, I would say that, the, that y yes. The, you know, the short answer yes is that uh, we are still ahead. Um, we still, I think, have the, the best fighting force. Um, and, and I think that you know, part of that is reliant upon a partnership, uh, partnership with allies, partnership with partner uh, with friendly nations, mm -hmm. and then a partnership which we are now starting to uh, dig into a little bit deeper is the partnership with industry. Yeah, uh, I was going to ask you about that because obviously you know this is a conference about AI and emerging technology, right. and one of the one of the uh, features of that emerging technology is quite how accessible it is, you know, yeah. quite how democratized that technology is becoming quite how easy it is, frankly, for people to adopt and start using technology. Is that, is that something that you've seen uh, from, from a U.S. military perspective? Is it something you can, you can keep pace with or stay ahead of? I, 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 do, I think that um, you know, we have a generation of service members coming into the service that uh, expect to use that technology. Right. Uh, they've grown up with it. Uh, the, this new generation has grown up using that technology uh, in their playtime, in uh, their, their gaming industry. Mm. And as they, as they grow into a professional career, they're going to come into uh, positions uh, in the military where they're going to expect to have that technology given to them to make them more effective and to have that technological advantage over the adversary. Right. Um, I think it's important for us to, we owe it to them to continue to refine the relationship with those that uh, have the corporate knowledge, uh, the intellect, uh, whether it's academia or private industry, to refine the ability to implement technology into the legacy systems to, to give those those uh, service members what they are, are expecting. So, so that I think does bring us on to you know you, issues around uh, collaboration with industry and the use of uh, of tools and their incorporation into military systems and onto the battlefield. Um, you know, I suspect you know a lot of people in the in the audience do uh, are interested in Project Maven and and, and sort of the um, uh, the use of artificial intelligence 
uh, within military systems. Do you want to say a few words about your uh, involvement in, in that particular project and, and you know, what, uh, um, to the extent that you can, yeah. um, you know, where it's taking us? Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, so uh, the, the, the disclaimer is that I'm retired now, so this is... Everyone get that? <laughs> captain Smith is retired. It's, it's a retired Captain yeah. Smith, uh, so not necessarily the uh, position of the Department of Defense, but um, I recently have worked closely with the application. Uh, I'm not the scientist. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not the data scientist. I, I don't write the algorithms, but I have been for 30 years the end user of the algorithms, of the technology. And my role was to, uh, I do have a little bit of a background with, um, in 1999, I uh, wrote a thesis paper on database mining as a uh, tool for an insurance marketing uh, plan. Uh, it doesn't I? sound like the typical no. special forces thesis. <laughs> no, no, that's, <laughs> that was drawn from my father who owned yeah. an insurance company. Right, right. And I said, you know, I think we can um, find uh, your customers a lot better if we uh, leverage database mining. And, yeah. You know, he was a World War II vet, and he said, that'll never work. <laughs> I got a call from him 10 years ago. He goes, you're way ahead of everyone else. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, So I have an appreciation for yeah. it, um, not necessarily an expertise, but I do have an expertise in the application of tools on the battlefield. And with that expertise, I was able to uh, engage with those scientists, uh, scientists out of uh, Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Labs, you know, from uh, industry uh, companies that are, that are, have the tools that we can apply on the battlefield. Uh, putting them together with the end user, um, l allowing them a dialogue at, at the ground level between the those that write the algorithm and those that employ it so that they can actually share the views on it. And what I, you know, what I wanted, my intent, was to you know, speed to market, get the, get the tool in the operator's hand faster. What I found, the, uh, a, um, an added benefit of it was a cultural exchange. And that, to me, was probably more important than the speed to market, was the cultural exchange between a SEAL operator and a uh, data scientist. Right. Uh, you know, two completely different worlds. Yeah. Uh, you, know, to, to, you, know, you imagine you know, that putting them together in a field environment and allowing them to share their, their views and their ideas, you know, that em empowering that uh, engagement when uh, it has taken this to the next level. So, so before we uh, invite the, the other members of the panel to join us, just on that, on that subject, perhaps you could give us some real world examples or a real world example to the extent that you can of how that manifests on the battlefield. What, what are the opportunities when you do bring together um, technical capability with SEAL team operators? What, what can you achieve? So what, 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 you, what you see is you, you, you see a, um, someone who understands the capabilities of the technology, the vast possibilities of the, te of the technology, him in, in a field environment uh, sharing with an operator that says, yeah, that's great that you, your technology can you know, track this type of uh, object for me, but I would like it to track only the objects that have you know, this certain color. That, that, you know, the, the, the data scientist, the algorithm writer says, well, that's easy. Yeah. Um, you know, never knew that's, that's what your interest was. Yeah. And so when, you learn, when they share that, um, now they start to understand what were the needs of the operator. The operator also, uh, likewise, understands limitations. Well, okay, you can't do that, but can you, can you do this? So... Now what we're able to do is to, is to leverage that you know, for a more effective use. Um, and I think that's important, is that that dialogue happen. So we, I'm, I'm gonna ask our, 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 our three other speakers to join us in a second. Just, just before I do, you know, we spoke a little earlier about sort of you know, new technologies reaching, reaching uh, the battlefield. Um, now, we're talking about artificial intelligence. Is it just a further, evolution of technologies, um, or is it something more significant than that? Uh, 
So my, my opinion is that I think that we, I, I would say in studying, you know, revolution of military affairs, we've seen them in the past, uh, you know, gunpowder, um, you know, transition from uh, uh, arrow, bow and arrow to the repeating rifle, those are revolutionary. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the airplane, yeah. revolution of military affairs. Um, you know, some people would say that the drone, you know, unmanned aerial vehicles are a revolution. I think that's more of an evolution of right. aviation. Right. Um, I do think that my opinion is that we are in the middle of a revolution of military affairs with applying artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, this technology to those evolutionary systems. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I think that the next generation will define how, how they use this technology with the legacy systems will define, you know, the extent of this revolution. I think that's a, thank you, uh, Bobby. I think that's a great moment actually to, to invite our other panelists to the stage so that we can get into some of the, the, um, the, the tough subjects around, around that revolution. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind, I'd like you to welcome, please, uh, Professor Noel Sharkey, uh, Dr. Uh, Uslem, I'm gonna get this wrong, I do apologize, Ulgem, and um, Oliver Lewis to the stage. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, so we're gonna continue the conversation, um, and uh, I'm, I'm hoping uh, all four of my eminent uh, uh, colleagues will, will take part, but what I thought we would do first is just hear from each of them for a couple of minutes uh, on their particular uh, area of, uh, of focus, and then we can move on to a, to a conversation uh, that talks about uh, AI and national security, the opportunities and the risks. So, um, uh, Jonathan, you're looking at me. I am looking at you first, Dr. Oslin. <laughs> no, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come to, uh, to Noel last. Um, but Dr. Oslin, would you like to just briefly introduce yourself and, and tell us a little about your, uh, your area of work, please? Okay, so uh, I'm a reader in international law and ethics. For the past six years, I've been working um, at the UN Group of Governmental Experts, trying to devise some norms, principles around lethal autonomous weapon systems, uh, ethical and legal norms. Um, I'm also on various expert groups for IEEE, which is an international standard setting body, um, the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers. And they are involved at the moment in very interesting work on an ontology of concepts around autonomous and intelligent systems, as well as automation and robotics, um, what would be the ethical standards for those, and then the process of building these. And separate to that, there is a certification process, believe it or not, for these systems, which I'm also uh, involved in. Uh, and that, as I understand it, is uh, primarily or initially focused on civilian technologies, but uh, as it with all indeed. things, if they are applicable within a military context, then those same approaches can be applied? It is indeed, and Captain Smith referred to military and civilian sphere cooperation, dual use technologies. This is a very hot topic. There are a number of issues there which perhaps we can pick up later on. Great. Uh, but that's one key area where uh, there are concerns, ethical concerns, okay. of exchange of knowledge and the purpose of use of these systems. But you're quite right, the certification program at the moment is in the civilian sphere. Uh, okay, well, perhaps we'll, we'll come to that, uh, come back to you in a, in a moment. Let me ask Ollie Lewis, uh, Rebellion Ventures, formerly of Improbable and formerly of the British government, um, to introduce himself and say a little about your, your take on this, uh, Ollie. I think I'm only two weeks out of government, so it feels liberating. <laughs> Probably something that Bobby can, can talk about, particularly with this government. Um, yeah, so as an academic and intelligence officer, uh, was in, improbable in GovTech and games, and then have just finished as the deputy director of the UK Government Digital Service to launch with uh, a few people, from Eric Schmidt to Jim Mattis and Ash Carter, a tech startup working in building software for national defense. And the reason why we think this is important sort of begins with, with how I think AI and national security is kind of like the first season of a TV show called The Good Place. Yeah, if any of you have seen that show, where broadly a bunch of uh, messy humans, they 
think they're in heaven, they're actually in hell in an intricate kind of torture. And you have the main protagonist, Eleanor, who is this proper every woman character who is very messy, very selfish, trying to be a good person. And you have her major love interest, Chidi, who is a moral philosopher. And I think where we are in AI and national security is Chidi at the moment. We're erudite, we're eloquent, and we're paralyzed into inactivity. And where we need to shift is to be Eleanor. So we need to <laughs> act, we need a bit of practical ethics, we need to try and do something, uh, and then correct when it goes wrong, because it will go wrong, but we won't be able to design for perfection. And the reason I think that's important is kind of three broad things, two of which were summed up quite neatly in The Guardian today, uh, which is always useful to say. And the, the first one was an article around this disclosure of documents from Russia, around how they are being incredibly strident in the African continent, how they want to get rid of the traditional Western states, how they're going to use private industry to do so, and co-opt many states within that continent. And the point there being that the only people playing this game in artificial intelligence and national security tend to be authoritarian capitalist regimes. And that terrifies me. The second thing in The Guardian was this disclosure that MI5 have been probably accidentally misleading a whole load of uh, judges and others around the data that they hold. And the point there not being that I think MI5 is full of, uh, full of liars, more the fact that government IT is just shit. <laughs> so it's not lethal autonomous weapons, it's not highly complex, amazing command centers with minority report screens, it's Microsoft Excel that typically doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> so there's just a pragmatism about applying really rudimentary machine learning uh, that we take for granted that needs to be in the national security space in order to uh, stop error and ensure that good things happen because the people are typically good and trying to be, trying to be Eleanor. And then the third reason which wasn't in The Guardian is who is coming to save us when it comes to national security and tech? At the moment, it's the authoritarian capitalist regimes. If not, it's the libertarian mafia in Silicon Valley. And the people who are not in the game, who are late to the party, are the liberals and the critical left. And that's who I think need to come into new tech startups, new entrepreneurial ventures, come into government, and be the absent voice, because it's that voice that I'm most optimistic about defining how we use technology in government. Thanks, uh, Oli. I, I I'm sure Bobby would agree with this, but it's almost always crap systems and incompetence rather than uh, conspiracy, but we can, uh, we can discuss that at length. Um, Noel, I, I, I suspect um, well, we'd, we'd like to hear your voice on this. Um, would you like to firstly introduce yourself and, uh, and give us a few thoughts uh, before we get into the discussion? Uh, I'm Noel Sharkey, and I'm an emeritus professor of robotics and artificial intelligence at the University of Sheffield. Uh, and I entered this space of technology, robotics and artificial intelligence, in 1979, so that's 40 years now. Um, but I also run an organization, co-direct an organization in The Hague called the Foundation for Responsible Robotics, which is an NGO. But today, I'm here to represent uh, another organization that I chair called the International Committee for Robot Arms Control. And we co-founded that in 10 years ago this year. And we work at the UN and we see a lot of Oslin as well. Um, and the concern with that is it's a group of scientists, scholars, uh, lawyers, international affairs people. And our concern is really about the delegation of the decision to kill to machines. Okay. What are the problems with that? That's what we're facing at the moment. Um, we have, shall I say a little bit about the technology? Or please do, yeah, about? please, yeah. So we have this sort of arms race beginning and it, it's getting very advanced now. I, I first noticed this, ooh, it was a bit late, I first noticed it in 2007 and wrote an article about it for The Guardian and that was the beginning of the erosion of my academic career and my beginning as a humanitarian activist. Um, because after writing that, I was invited to talk to 30 of the world's militaries, so I got to know an awful lot about military that I never knew or wanted to know before. 
Um, and, and did a lot of talking with, uh, with our NGO. And our mission was to try to get international discussion about these weapons that were just starting to be developed. The US was well in the lead at that point. But then it got to the point where we weren't succeeding in getting international discussion. People were listening. But then Human Rights Watch came to see me in Sheffield in 2012. And suddenly I was in New York talking to a lot of NGOs and we formed a coalition called the Campaign to Stop Killer Robots, which has a, a, Nobel, a whole bunch of Nobel laureates involved. We have 104 NGOs from 54 countries. We have thousands of scientists now and scientific groups uh, and lots of companies like London's Deep Mind on board. So, so it's grown really massively. And we're at the UN, but why are we bothering to do all this? What, what's the problem? Um, well, I won't go through the problems yet, but I'll just tell you about the tech as it's developing. We're not, when I say killer robots, I would prefer, I'm an academic, I'd prefer autonomous weapon systems, but you know, it doesn't really catch <laughs> the imagination so well. Amazon also have the acronym yeah. but, copyrighted. So. Yeah, but, but it's, it's, um, it's the idea is that you're not, and we're not talking here about, although every time there's an article in the newspaper, guess what the, what the picture is. It's always Arnold bloody Schwarzenegger. Right? <laughs> Um, I wrote an article for the, uh, I wrote a feature for the, for the Telegraph some time ago and was really careful about how I explained everything and they put the headline on March of the Killer Robots with all these sort of Terminator things. But it's not that. We're talking about things that look like the kind of conventional weapons that Batman might have designed. Um, we're talking about tanks, submarines, ships, um, and especially fighter jets. Now, the US is particularly good on the fighter jet front with things like the X-47B, which can take off and land on aircraft carriers completely on their own. None of these are making the decision to kill yet, okay? These are just the platforms. Um, we also have the US developing uh, ground vehicles and ships, and, and Russia now is very, very involved, as you'd expect, in development of tanks. Kalashnikov is the first company to admit that it's actually developed a neural network trained targeting system, right, that can select its own targets and kill them. There's a documentary about it coming up from the New York Times soon. Turkey are getting involved now. Israel have, have announced that they want air, land, and sea, uh, fully autonomous robots coordinating together within the next five years, and that was a year ago. So, so we're, we're moving there. Um, so this arms race is starting. The UK have got this ironclad, right, tank, which is this size, so we're not too scary. But it's a, most of the stuff being developed now are what you call proof of concept. Uh, but there's a lot of weasel stuff being talked about who's in control, about the notion of human control. Um, and the scariest part of this, because I'm very, very concerned about international, you know, global stability, um, which I wasn't to begin with, but now I am, because what everybody's talking about is force multiplication. You'll know about that yeah, term yeah. very well. Um, and I'm very aware that this man could snap my neck, so I have to be very polite. As much, as much, um, not, on my, not, on my, not on my watch. <laughs> yeah, you, like you're going to be able to do that. <laughs> um, uh, so... <laughs> I forgot what it was. Oh, swarms. So everybody's talking about swarms now. Uh, the US are up to 110 swarm of, of little planes. So Russia are talking about swarms of tanks. And they've got this thing called the T-14. You might know about it, the Armata, which is a yes. pretty scary vehicle. Uh, American military advisors tell me it's at least 10 years ahead of anybody else. And they're hoping to make this is a massive thing. Uh, and you can see it working, can hold the turret steady while the tank spins around. It can be remote controlled at the minute, and they're working as quickly as possible to make this autonomous with the idea of having swarms of them. So, so this is the state of affair now. You want to have swarms of submarines, swarms of ships, swarms of fighter aircraft. Now, the US is very concerned because of a RAND report a few years ago that you wouldn't, couldn't win in the Pacific completely outgunned. Mm -hmm. If every missile, every bullet hit right. its target, you haven't a chance in right. there. And so the idea, there's been simulations of having all these sort of swarms of autonomous things like the X-47B fighter jets, uh, rafts, autonomous rafts full of autonomous missiles. I mean, this is the kind of 
theoretical plans. And the big problem with these theoretical plans, and I point this out and embarrass the bloody Defence Department all the time, is how come you're looking at 10 years ahead and you've got all these great autonomous weapons? And in all the simulations, China has exactly the same weapons as it has today. It hasn't advanced at all. But it's developing, it's developing a lot of stuff. They've, they're developing air-to-air, -air, autonomous air-to-air fighter jets that are supersonic speed. So people are talking about supersonic speeds and hypersonic speeds. You've got a machine, I forget what it is, the X something, unmanned, can fly at 13,000 miles an hour. I mean, we're talking about the US want to have a, a, a swarm of these that can reach anywhere on the planet within the space of one hour. I don't know about the rest of you, but I find this a little bit scary. And maybe I'll get a chance on questioning to explain yeah. sure. some of the actual technical sure. problems. So, so thanks, Noel. Thanks, everybody, for, for your introductory remarks. I think you, you, you set that up very well for a, for a follow-on conversation because it, it begs the obvious question, you know, in terms of national security, what should we do? Because this technology, as you've so eloquently said, no, it's, it's either there already or it is coming very soon. And classic theory uh, from, you know, we'll all have studied it and implemented it uh, around protecting yourselves. It revolves around deterrence. It revolves around having superior capability and super, superior force. Um, what is the answer if it is not matching or, or having a... a, a, a sort of an advantage in terms of, of capability over our adversaries. I might come to Uslem second, but I might ask Bobby just to, just to come back on that first. Um, so when, when we look at the uh, technology and the and weaponeering of the technology, I think that that is, that's important to understand that. Uh, but at the same time, we should also understand that what about the you know, non-lethal applications that are very useful and critical to survival? Uh, you know, consider a scenario where you have Marines at an outpost location from the main operating base. They need resupply. Um, real real um, world accounts of Marines in a, in a supply convoy delivering them supplies that die en route to delivering supplies. You know, autonomous uh, capabilities removes that threat and we can you know, unmanned aerial vehicles, unmanned ground vehicles, resupply the Marines with no threat to human life. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the same uh, technology that, you know, there's that fine line is when does it become weaponized? Um, and so I think that, you know, when, you know, in other applications, we should consider all applications and not jump and leap into the weaponeering piece uh, because it distracts from some, and, and it may prevent us from leveraging technology for, and we like to use um, acronyms in the military, uh, CT, <laughs> counterterrorism, COIN, counterinsurgency. There's two other acronyms that, that we currently are really working on right now for application of the technologies, uh, uh, humanitarian, HA, humanitarian assistance. Uh, DR, disaster relief. Uh, recently, we, we employed some of the lessons, you know, some of the uh, uh, technology that we're using with MAVEN towards the uh, you know, Hurricane Florence last December in the United States with the southern states under severe flooding conditions where the areas that uh, disaster relief can, uh, is needed the most. Uh, how, do you, how do you direct those that are providing disaster relief to those that really need it so that you're getting uh, that on time, on target, and it's not lethal at all. And so I think that, you know, as we look at it, let's not overshadow the goodness that, that you know, we are using with, you know, a you know, potential uh, conflict in, you know, theories on, hey, is this being weaponized? If, if there's a chance of being weaponized, let's stop doing it. Well, then you, you may lose that application in a, in a good space. So it's a, it's a very interesting uh, counter to, 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 to Noah's point, and it gives me an opportunity well, to bring... Sorry, sorry, could I just say one sentence, because yeah, I please, should have yeah. made something a bit clearer here. Yeah. Uh, in our campaign, we're not interested in stopping any kind of autonomy in yeah. the military or elsewhere. We're interested in two critical functions of autonomy, yeah. and that is selecting targets 
and killing them or applying violent force. So that, that, that's, that, that's a very yeah. extremely I important clarification. Yeah. I think it, it, it does so offer us, therefore, an opportunity to talk about the frameworks that we put in place and the, and the, and the, the systems that we've used historically to, to govern the battle space and to constrain um, the use of lethal force and to protect both uh, soldiers and civilians. Uh, what, 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 what do you think are the, the, the sort of the perspectives that we can bring to bear here, uh, Oslam, in, in, in terms of, you know, using some of those um, approaches to, you know, distinguish between the lethal and the non-lethal use of the technology? I want to connect these two points here and introduce another acronym, the OODA loop. OODA loop. But this fits in very nicely with what Noel has said and okay. also um, Captain Smith. So where you are introducing this technology actually matters because Noel has just identified two areas which are quite problematic, the selection and the attack mode, which could actually remove human involvement, and that's the concern ethically and legally. But what the UDA loop is concerned with, essentially uh, acquiring a target, you acquire the target, you um, track the target, you select the target, and the final stage is the attack. That attack mode, if that phase is being autonomized, that is problematic ethically and also legally. At the moment, the laws of war are predicated on individual responsibility, individuals. If you are talking about an autonomous system that is fulfilling that function, how do you then connect to responsibility if things go wrong, if the rules are breached, if there are grave breaches? That's one thing. The other point is in the selection stage. The information that is going in to eventually perhaps reach the final stage of attack. Is there a human being assessing the data and confirming, affirming that this is correct, we can continue along the line. That's quite critical phase as well. So Noel mentioned critical functions, and this is the term that's being used at the UN at the moment with a group of governmental experts. What are the critical functions that an autonomous system, and there are varying degrees of autonomy that can be introduced here, at what stage is that being introduced? And, and I think we need to understand it along that spectrum. And we also need to understand it in terms of different terrains, you know, land, air, sea. Um, you mentioned about an arms race, and uh, I have also been out to China last <coughs> year, and I know fully well that their overall AI strategy is quite advanced, but it's combining the civilian and military sphere, and this is the dual purpose point. For them, it's an economic driver a domestic economic driver to advance with AI. And it's partly related to <coughs> population size. But that feeds into the military context. And you'll see in other jurisdictions as well, the civilian sphere, how this technology is being used is, is driving what's going on in the military as well. And that's the dual use, um, dual use aspect to these technologies, AI, when we talk about AI or autonomous systems, which um, can be problematic as well. To, to, to Ollie's point earlier, and I know Ollie, you wanted to jump in, just give me one second. Um, is, is this uh, something that we are talking about somewhat in isolation, isolation, or at least amongst friends? Is this a conversation that's taking place at the ethical and legal level, truly internationally, and does it have a chance of binding in uh, China, Russia, uh, other nations. Okay, so at the UNGG group of governmental experts, you've got 126 states parties. That's the United States, that's the United Kingdom, that's France, that's China, that's Russia. And actually, it's one of the more relatively successful UN processes because it does lead to some sort of codification after a number of years. There is a central treaty, and around that uh, protocols that are attached to it. But I've noticed, and perhaps Noel has over the past few years, that whilst the states may represent a particular strategy, for example, the United States may be um, initially is, is very much in favor of codification and was very much in progressing the GGE. Russia at the start was rather reluctant. It didn't want to formalize the process of codification. But in the end, it's on board. But actually, what's going on is a convergence of a final objective, which is perhaps not to have clear um, standards or norms. 
that is suited to what is existing in the current military sphere and what is expected to be advanced. So that there are these dynamics going on. They are all at the, uh, in this forum. They're all on board. But as to where we're going to end up, at the moment we're with guiding principles, which are non-legally binding, but at least everybody is at the table because this is a consensus process. So if one is out, the whole thing collapses. Mm. And the way to achieve that consensus over the years has been to gradually bring on board through, through this process. What we end up with is a different matter. At, at the moment, we have guiding principles, but I certainly have noticed over the years that there's been this convergence, uh, different strategies, but ultimately it's, it's perhaps leading to the same objective, which could be to have watered down standards. Allowing the kind of arms race that... Uh, yes, that and, and not forgetting a key thing here in the GGE, in its mandate, um, the very specific term emerging technologies was introduced. And that was for a very specific reason. Key states did not want to include existing technologies currently in use as part of the codification process. By using the phrase emerging technologies, that excludes uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, what's currently being used, and everything that's going to follow. But actually, the, you, you, what you've got now, you build upon and you enhance it. That's, that's what's going on. That's a very key indicator of this process. Ollie, you, were, you wanted to jump in, I think. Just, um, <coughs> I suppose, two things. On, in terms of I see Oslem and, and Noel kind of for the 21st century, what Bertrand Russell was for the 20th, where there's that, that conscience. And however, though, is it his complete pacifism toward the First World War, or is this now a contingent pacifism in his attitude toward the Second World War? And I think with AI, we're closer to that agonizing moral compromise of the Second War than we are the certainty of the First. And the... Uh, the reason I use that equivalent is that I see two tracks in terms of the development of artificial intelligence. The one track is like the nuclear movement, and it's, from a national security perspective, we have to build this technology in order to have parity so that our adversaries don't use it, and then we never use it too. And that's where absolutely we need the international agreements. But then the second track is the, we're gonna use artificial intelligence in the planning process, the much more mundane conduct of conventional war, and that will give us the competitive advantage when we have to, to ensure that liberalism more broadly is still a power on the world stage. However, I think the selection of targets comes into the second category. And the reason I think that is because of the present mode of selecting targets is very compromised human beings. It's kind of like the exhausted NHS doctor doing a misdiagnosis. It's people like me reading intelligence reports, looking at printed photographs and thinking, I think it's him, let's go and kill or capture. A machine will be better at that, and the wrong people Possibly. won't be killed Possibly. as a consequence. Yeah, awesome. you, you, you were, <laughs> we were talking about this uh, before, and perhaps you could just say a few words about why you think that, that can be problematic. Um, I think if you have got human-machine interaction at this selection stage, it can be very efficient and it can achieve that level of accuracy. However, we have seen with the unmanned aerial vehicles where you have got that reliance on the data set that it's turned out awfully wrong. Um, the Doesn't that still come down to human error? Well, possibly in the... Uh, how should I put this, the, the ease of um, accepting what is thrown back at you from the machine because it's going to be accurate. It's, it's bound to be better than me. It's not as tired as me. No, there's judgment. There's human judgment, which always must be there. Rather than the... Captain Smith spoke about the intensity of these machines, what they can do in terms of uh, synthesizing information, analyzing it at a much greater speed than the human brain, of course. But the judgment, that qualitative assessment... That's something which you can't replicate in a machine. And it could be very, very time sensitive that a human target has moved out of that zone and it's now a different zone. It's a civilian zone. It's a mixed zone. Mm. You've got to allow the human eye, the human mind, to be able to make that snap judgment at the last minute. Could, could, no, can I ask, ask you to sort of argue your 
point on this. Would you agree with Dr. Aslem that I'm just selection of targets is... Sorry, did you have something else? Yeah, well, to I was going to say, I, I mean, it's, yeah. it's not about that. Let's just jump out of this fantasy here about what AI can do and its great accuracy. Um, it, yes, a, a, an AI system could, could shoot somebody maybe more accurately than a human, but it's not much good if it accurately kills the wrong people. My, my concerns are humanitarian. I can't see how you can guarantee. Look, let's look at face recognition, which everybody sells all the time. Okay, so it's 98% accurate in the lab if you happen to be a white male that's clean shaven. But if you look at our police force use, and this is known from freedom of information, you know, we know this. I'm going on, a, on an ex exhibition, expedition with the police because of my mouthing off about it. But we found out that the police, at best, they're pointing cameras into crowds doing face recognition and pulling people out as dangerous criminals, right? The best they have done is 5% accuracy. At the Notting Hill Carnival, 2% accuracy. As your shade of skin gets darker, accuracy gets really bad. You can't rely on computers for things. I mean, for God's sake, I've been working in them for so many years. So, it's so, a nonsense to think that no, no, this technology is really, going to be some sort so great, of great uh, I think we really have to discuss this in a bit more detail. But I suspect yeah. there's a challenge to that, that in certain areas already, um, uh, you know, machine learning applied to certain areas is more yeah. efficient, is yeah. more effective. Yeah. Why, and, so, and to Ollie's point about being pragmatic about this and finding ways to use the technology in ways that are advantageous, is there no way that we can do that? Machine learning is, is, is I mean, I worked, I've been working machine learning since 1981. It's an amazing technology if you want to classify things. Yes, we want to classify and great for health stuff and stuff. Yeah. Brilliant, That's sort of what play, I was getting. brilliant at playing games in a closed world. What every computer system has is, is got problematic with is unanticipated circumstances. Mm -hmm. Now, you tell me, is warfare, you know, are there any unanticipated circumstances? <laughs> it's a great question. <laughs> so, 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 Bobby, well, I mean, infinite well, 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 I think that, I mean, you, I mean warfare is defined by unanticipated. Let me give you an example. Let the man answer the question. Let me, let me uh, give you no. an example. <laughs> your, own, your own forces, right. Uh, Afghanistan, uh, a group of Marines caught some insurgents in an alleyway, okay? Uh, had their guns ready to kill them. They noticed they were carrying a coffin. So right. what did they do? They yeah. took off their helmets, lowered their guns, and bowed their heads and let them go past. A machine would have just killed them all. Of course it would. Unless well, you programmed the machine, right. if there's a coffin there, you yes. know, don't shoot people. Now, every terrorist there is would have a coffin tied to their shoulder. You know, I mean, of course, yeah. this technology can be gamed all the time. When I go and examine a PhD, the first thing I do is break the system. It's not that hard. Yeah. And it's okay if you're playing a game of chess or a game of Go, which is really difficult engineering feat, but it's yeah. all very, very static. And that's just the problem with that. Now, the other insanity, if I just let, let me... Yep, just, please. Is, yep. is, is the US, right, talked about why are you developing autonomous weapons? Why, why are you interested in this at the beginning? And it's the, their answer was, we have lost our edge with missile technology. China is getting ahead very, very fast. It's got ahead. Hypersonic missiles now that can hit anywhere in the US and can't even be stopped. But I, I think that, that, that is a... Right. No, so, Bob, but, Bob, but I'd like to give you a chance that, to... So, yeah, but uh, I'll give you a chance. Yeah. But, but what this thing... <laughs> so we're, lost, we're running lost, out of time. I should, okay. Yeah. You've lost the military edge in missile right. technology. So let's get into a whole other technology that in 10 years down the road we'll have lost the edge again. Right. The whole world will have this technology and we'll be in a much worse place than we were to begin with. So I think it's Sorry, a, that's a very real, losing the edge of this technology is a very real threat uh, to our national security. And that's why I think that we need to stay ahead of that. Um, where we may, we, you know, the missile technology is not the driving force behind this. It's the competitive, it's the adversarial co competition with, with China. Uh, they, they aren't playing by the same rules. Um, it's very clear. They don't play by the same rules. They don't play by the same ethical codes of standards. Um, you know, we, we have commanders on the battlefield that currently right now, lethal decisions are made by commanders, uh, human commanders, not made by machines. Uh, are we, uh, you know, what's the future hold? Does the future hold where a machine can make that decision? Uh, you know, that, that's still to be determined. And I think we need to, you know, look at as machine learning, if we are going to truly treat it as machine learning, we need to find a way of machine learning the same way that our commanders learned 
the ethical codes of conduct, the ethical standards. How do you apply that to the machine learning? Because we have a commander right now that is today, you know, he is looking at the information and you know, the term, the human in the loop, human out of the loop, you know, I, I like to see it as neither, as a human on the loop. So we need that loop of technology to continue to run autonomously while the human is still attached to it in some form or fashion. Uh, you know, that human is your checks and balance. Um, Jonathan, sorry, yes, 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 please, yes, please. a couple of things. Yeah. Um, the human in the loop, human control, this point about um, the ethics that should be in the machine, I, it reminds me of, I can't remember who it was in the military who said, you know, let's download Geneva law into a machine. It's just not possible. Mm. And there is discretion. Uh, there is, you know, that, that sort of evasive thing that, that humans do and it's context driven it's it's judgment it's but it's we, perhaps a personal feeling but it's nevertheless it's there it's part of the decision making i get i get the sense though that we're talking a little about we're talking about very tactical decisions in in this part of the conversation the the really interesting question i want to put back to you is that we broadly successfully managed to put in place frameworks around nuclear weapons Mm. Um, now, we can argue till we're blue in the face about that, but nonetheless, uh, there hasn't been a, a use of nuclear weapons uh, since, uh, since they were first uh, established. And if it was possible for us to put in place uh, ethics and systems around those weapons, uh, why isn't it possible for us to put in place weapon, uh, systems around, around these? What you have got with nuclear weapons is an all-encompassing capability. And it's the detect, uh, uh, it's the threat uh, deterrent aspect of it. But with these technologies, it's low intensity, different scenarios. It's all pervasive. It's dual use. Mm. It's um, you know, it, it's not so easy to anchor down. One point that could be an area of convergence with adversaries, actually, and speaking to <coughs> militaries across the board, two things come up. One is there is an area of concern where it exposes you to the enemy that you couldn't possibly use this technology. So there's no point in introducing the technology there because it's too vulnerable. The other point is hacking. If you're having to maintain a communications link for the use of this technology and that's quite vulnerable to hack, again, mm. that's not going to suit the military's purpose. So, um, there is a point there where you, you can have this, if you want to call it good convergence, sensible thinking that it's not just a race for the purpose of a race, but really this, it's, we cannot use this because it's not going to be to our advantage because of those vulnerabilities. And just on the final point, yeah. interoperability. Um, with friendly allies, there can be exchange of knowledge of technology, but once you've got the swarm scenario and you've got different standardization being set up in different jurisdictions, how are they going to communicate? So it's not just a case of being concerned about how you develop the technology with your allies, but you're going to be meeting adversaries who've developed it in a different context. How are these swarms going to interact? That's the global governance point. That's the wider threat issue. Um, I'm afraid uh, we, we have run out of time. I think we could have continued Sorry, this conversation. No, not at all. I think we could have <laughs> continued this conversation for uh, a couple of hours, if not more. It's, it is an enormously complicated subject. And uh, firstly, I'd like to thank uh, Captain Robert Smith uh, for joining us today, uh, to, for him to share some of his experiences of, of using technology uh, in the battlefield and, and, and looking at it from a, from a military and a politician's perspective. I'd also like to thank Dr. Zlem, uh, Ollie, and, and Professor Noel uh, for their contribution to the conversation. I hope you'll join me in thanking them all. Thank you.